Welcome to Travel Unraveled. I'm your host, Blake. Join me each month as I sit down with friends, fellow world travelers, and experts of all kind to candidly and unapologetically discuss any and everything about travel. I'm very excited this month to have uh, an extraordinary guest, a good friend of mine, Mr. Patrick Duggan. He is an environmental prosecutor for uh, the U.S. Department of Justice. He is a world traveler. He's been to an unknown amount of places. Maybe he knows. Patrick, welcome. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure. So let's uh, let's jump right in. When did you first know you wanted to become a lawyer? And how did you decide to pursue environmental law and get into a prosecution? Uh, well, I'm still not sure I want to be a lawyer. So uh, that's, that's an ongoing <laughs> it's an ongoing process. You know, the reality is I, I really fell backwards into it. I never intended on being a lawyer. I was always an environmental advocate. Um, as you know, I used to be uh, an engineer working on in, uh, renewable energy and, and various other, you know, do-gooder engineering things. And then after doing that for a few years, I, I got a little... Got a little bored, I guess. Uh, had my quarter life crisis and decided to make a turn. And you know, the thing is, I was always very interested in the natural resources themselves, the trees, the squirrels. I was growing up. I desperately wanted to be a squirrel catcher. Unfortunately, that wasn't a career path that existed. <laughs> um. So, you know, I, I was very interested in going back to grad school to help me make that turn. And when working on that and making that decision, I was advised by a bunch of different professors that for what I wanted to do, it would probably be good to get a law degree. And uh, I had one kind of formative experience where I was working on a renewable energy project for the city of Chicago public schools that ended up not happening. And yet these two city, Chicago city lawyers were able to get a lot of renewable energy put into the schools by writing, you know, a regulation for the city and basically did more with uh, with their pen than I did with my engineering. They did it in three weeks and it'd take me two years to try to build that project. So, so it was really kind of about how you could make the most impact and an actionable change. Yeah, that's exactly what it what it was. Now, what I thought I was going to do going into law school is very different than the career paths that were actually open to me. And I ended up getting really lucky getting into the, the position I'm in directly from law school. But uh, it's not an easy path. You know, there's a lot of people who care about the environment and there's not that many jobs. Is there something specific you focus on? Or I know you've kind of have been all over the globe and have worked on all kinds of different environmental problems. Do you have a specialty or is it just whatever's the most urgent? Uh, six of one, half dozen of the other, you know. I So my, my jurisdiction, if you will, is any federal environmental crime. So that encompasses the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, FIFRA, which is like the fungicide and insecticide sure. act. I don't even, um, but what I, and so I do some of those. What I really focus on is trade in endangered species of fish, animals, and trees. And um, trees are the nearest and dearest to my heart. And so that's about half my work is working on illegally logged timber that is making its way to the United States. But, you know, I also deal uh, in illegal oysters and ginseng and uh, rare endangered snakes. I have to imagine a lot of that stuff is coming through Asia and or almost exclusively coming through Asia. You know, yes and no. It, you've got these kind of subcultures throughout the world that are interested in certain things. So, like, you, you've got a big market for endangered North American snakes in Northern Europe, like Denmark and Germany. And so they're buying our snakes. Wow. Um, 
you know, there are certain species of fish like Asian arowana and glass eels that are really popular in Asia. You've also got, you know, South America, all of the exotic hardwoods that are coming from the Amazon right now at eBay, I-P-E, is all the rage in terms of uh, wood to be used to build outdoor furniture and decks and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's all coming from South America, sometimes through Asia. So it it really, um, and then you, well, obviously you've got all of our charismatic mega fauna in Africa. So uh, rhinos, elephants, pangolins, uh, all these, all these animals that exist in Africa, those are being their parts and them themselves. They're also being shipped all around the world, including the United States. So do you know what, if any truth there is to the whole, like, COVID-19 happened because of a pangolin and a bat and this and that. I mean, <laughs> listen, I know the same thing that you know. Nothing. <laughs> which it just depends on, yeah, how, how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go? <laughs> We're all defining our own reality at this point, right? Exactly. You know, from what I read, the scientists are pretty confident that it started with a pangolin or a bat or both, or it was transferred from a pangolin to a bat, you know, but I am no DNA scientist, uh, or I guess that'd be called a geneticist. (laughs) (laughs) You're no scientist at all. Right, exactly. (laughs) I'm not any kind of scientist, never mind a DNA (laughs) scientist. So I'll defer that question. So uh, this was further down the list, but it kind of fits in with what I was saying. Um, You know, this day and age, you're hearing so much about fake news or mistrust of the media, mistrust, conspiracy theories. Like, where do you find your most reliable sources of news? Is it in certain areas you find more unbiased or do you just source a bunch of different sources and kind of come to your own conclusions? I, I got a bunch of sources. I, I To me, it's like a macrame bracelet, right? You take all these different sources and you weave it together. And when you, when you get it all together, you can kind of find out what the truth is. You know, and I, I go to the major news sites. And then in terms of environmental issues, there are some outlets that are really very well trusted. They do a lot of research. And so I kind of, focus on those. I, I'm always looking for like peer-reviewed studies. Is there a peer-reviewed study? If there is, can I get it? Can I just read that instead of reading somebody else's uh, summary of that? You know, but then there's, there's, you look at websites, places like Washington Post or LA Times and stuff, they do source, they actually do source verification. So that makes it, to me, if you're citing your sources in the paper, it's more likely for me to believe it. Sure. You know, as a prosecutor, a big part of what I do is listen to what people say and then decide what's true, what's not, and how I can fact check. And that's really, when you boil down my job, that's 90% of it, is basically fact checking what people say. Yeah. So on that token, I mean, how much of it is is dancing around loopholes and such within the laws, right? Because you have all these Clean Air Acts and this and that, and I'm sure they're being amended constantly. And, you know, there's ways that people, they might want what's environmentally right, but of course, you know, money talks and <laughs> and I'm sure you have conflict of interest all over the place. Like, how do you navigate that type of stuff on your cases? Well, I've got it a lot easier than some people. Because I only do criminal law, there are lots of loopholes. There are lots of companies and individuals who are trying to go right up to that line but not cross it. If they do cross it a little bit, that's probably not going to be criminal. I I like to say I deal with people who lie, cheat, and steal. Just I do it related to the environment. So I don't deal as much with people trying to exploit the little loopholes I deal with the people who are like, hey, there's a loophole. That seems like a pain in the butt. I'm just going to break the law. Yeah. 
I'm not going to do. I'm not. That loophole seems like I'm going to need an attorney to try to get through that. Now, I mean, other than pure greed, what incentivizes these people or corporations or governments or whatever it may be to to say, "Hey, I'm going to get away with this"? Greed is number one. Greed is absolutely number one, especially when you're dealing with fisheries and timber, right? Because you think about that, there's no legal international market in elephant ivory, like large scale. Yeah. But when you're dealing with timber and fisheries, the same tree could be legal or illegal, depending on where it's cut, how it's cut, what time of year, do they have a permit, fisheries, did you catch over your limit, did you not catch over your limit? So with those, to me, I really think it does come down more to greed. You want to make more money. Easier to hide those types of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it makes our cases pretty difficult. And that's one reason, you know, I end up traveling a lot is because it's not easy to get the information you need to prove that the bad guy knew what he was doing. But those are not the interesting cases. The coolest cases are the ones with the people who are just obsessed. It's a drug. It's an addiction. Like, eyelash vipers are an addiction to some people. I'm not really interested in keeping a snake that could kill me under my bed. It's like me and the eBay gambling and (laughs) the auctions, right? You're like, it's just another way of getting your fix. And uh, yeah. Exactly. And like you've got people who are obsessed with with hummingbirds. You've got people who are obsessed with snakes. You've got people who are obsessed with everything you can imagine. There's somebody who has like just become overwhelmed by their desire for that thing. And it's not about the greed. It's about the thing. That makes me think of Tiger King. I'm sure you uh, are. Oh, yeah. As... It's funny because that show, I mean, at the time it was really what the pandemic needed, right? We needed like (laughs) this escape. But of course, like the more you watch it, the more you're really just kind of saddened by like not only Joe Exotic and these people, but how massive that industry is within the United States, right? Of these zoos and just, you know, people thinking it's okay to like pet these tiger cubs because, you know, they got a photo on Instagram or whatever. Right. I really like Tiger King. Not, I mean, I liked it in a lot of ways, but one major way is, I mean, that is almost exactly what I do. Right. For me, for it to be federal, there are certain jurisdictional issues that you, hoops that you need to jump through in terms of like, it has to cross state lines. It has to be, you know, illegal beforehand, that kind of stuff. But In general, we're dealing in a lot of these um, big cat cases and stuff like that. We're dealing with usually people who really at one point did love the animals. And then it became uh, uh, an avenue to fame or fortune. They lose their way and then, you know, end up getting caught. And that's where sometimes I come in. And I like Tiger King because it really did shine a light on the fact that these industries exist because there's a lot of people who will spend their whole life and not know, never know that there's such a thing as a roadside zoo. It's wild, right? I mean, I can't, there's pros and cons to zoos in general, right? But it's really, it's tough to look at them the same way. I mean, and sad to say, right, in, probably in our lifetime, some of these animals that I and I think you have been fortunate enough to see in the wild we're only going to be able to see them in zoos, so. Yeah. Dude, soon after we came back from the Philippines, uh, we got a case in with someone trafficking moder- uh, monitor lizards from the Philippines. The same ones that, like, you and I were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right outside the little hut. Yeah. Part of that's like, man, do you really want that animal in your house? Come on. <laughs> So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Philippines. We had an awesome trip. Um, We went to a number of islands, uh, Cebu, Bohol, um, some smaller islands off of there, uh, Boracay, um, Palawan. I know you had been to Southeast Asia before. What about the Philippines surprised you? And what, what made the Philippines sort of outstanding compared to some other 
popular spots in Southeast Asia? That's a really good question. For me, you know, I had been to the Philippines before, but not, I, I'd only been to the big, you know, the big island, Luzon, um, which is cool. What really, really still warms my heart about the Philippines is just the people. It's such a unique blend of like Western sarcasm sometimes and, and almost like the, the more South American love for fun and singing. And, and yet at the same time, it's obviously in Asia and, um, you know, the, so at the same time, they've got a lot of the really interesting Asian history and, and cultural aspects in terms of how they treat their families and how they take care of the elderly and all that stuff that, um, but it's not that common in my experience in Asia to have a random person who you've never met before tease you. <laughs> and that happens all over in the Philippines and I love it. There's no way to make me more comfortable than to start making fun of me. So uh, that I, I just loved it. But and then you've just got, I mean, the variety and and the fact that it's not overcrowded, you can go to these unbelievable places and be largely by yourself. I mean, that that beach we went to where we were taking muscle pictures. Like, yeah, yeah. The uh, and also, I mean, just how relative to us, how cheap it is to to get around oh, as yeah. well. I mean, the cost of living there is just nothing, and. You know, people yeah. are living off the land, like they're just chopping down bananas and coconuts in their backyard and, and living off it and living happily, you know, with not wanting material possession or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It. I mean, I like to think I would be happy living that life, but also I do like uh, my modern conveniences, probably <laughs> less than the average person. But nonetheless, you know, I am I'm, I'm pretty into having my soda stream with you. <laughs> Gotta have those bubbles. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, wait. Is this let's see, is this gonna have is this gonna show up on the audio? Yeah. <laughs> I can add some uh, bubbly sound effects for you as Patrick drinks his delicious and healthy soda stream water. Mm. Is it healthy or is this just going to be the next thing we find out is killing us? I mean, <laughs> God, uh, yeah, don't even get me started. Uh, um, uh, another thing, uh, you know, you're a you're a big scuba diver. Yeah. So and you've done diving all over the planet and obviously a major environmental issue, this sort of mass coral bleaching that we're seeing. So. I know the Philippines even pretty untouched and I'd never even come close to seeing marine life of that nature. I mean, the biodiversity, the pure number of fish and coral, but we were even seeing kind of early signs, right? Of bleaching in some of our spots. Yeah. Is that a big impact for you guys? Um, or is it so vague to pinpoint a crime that it's a hard to really prosecute? Yeah, I mean, that is that is where the law has not caught up to the reality yet. You can't necessarily pinpoint it. Now, there are still places in the Philippines and elsewhere uh, around the world where people fish with dynamite. That's illegal. That's a crime. Um, but who is the one who's causing coral bleaching? Is it, you know, major coal mines that are causing, you know, increased... Uh, temperatures? Is it each individual who's driving a car is, you know, it's, we don't even fully understand all of the factors that go into what's happening under that, that part of the ocean that most of us use that top, you know, six inches that we surf on or, or stand up pedalboard on. So, you know, there's really no way to hold anyone accountable right now. The best I think we can do is try to slow down the things that we do know are making, having an impact. But that's a political discussion that I, uh, you know, <laughs> am not going to engage in right now. Yeah, I, I prefer not to get too political either. Um, but I 
do speculate that kind of moving forward, it seems as like bureaucracies seem to get in the way of simple truths like, hey, we need to change all of us, humanity, not the U.S. or one other country. Um, you wonder if it'll be just kind of eccentric billionaires that sort of just say, you know, screw any government. Like, I've got the capital. Like, let's get this done. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. I don't know how many subscribers you have that are billionaires, but I'm going <laughs> to go ahead right now and make my pitch to all you billionaires listening. Please do. Do it. <laughs> Give away all your money to help stop climate change <laughs> and also eradicate poverty and provide clean water to people who need it and health care. So thank you, billionaires. <laughs> and I mean, that is an important thing to bring up as well, right? I feel like you get a lot of championing for one cause uh, with without acknowledging that all these causes are connected, right? It's like we need to address them together it's not like just clean water is the problem it's it's connected to everything else right i mean the, to me the the best example of that that's close to home is the gulf of mexico right we've got this massive dead zone in the gulf of mexico which impacts our capability to fish there even sustainably fish uh, to harvest shrimp from there, to use it as a recreational area. Why is that happening? Because not, not because anyone's dumping things into the ocean. It's largely groundwater chemicals in the groundwater that are running off largely from the Midwest in the Mississippi River, causing algal blooms that are killing everything when they come out. So there's no way to separate, you know, factory farming that's happening in Iowa to the fact that there's barely anything living in, in the estuaries of the Mississippi River where it comes out in the Deep South. That Wow, that's pretty incredible. I mean, yeah, you just think geographically, oh, it's so far away, you know, there is no connection. Right. Well, yeah. Talk to talk to some folks in northern Mexico who don't get the Colorado River anymore, and they're going to be like, "No, we get it." <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a connection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just saying the the lay person, you know, it's yeah, we we don't think about these things. We just sort of go on with our lives as if all these systems are perfectly working, and we have this right. easy solution. And yeah, the people causing the problem are less likely to see it than the people receiving the problem. Sure. You know, when you used to be a fisherman in Louisiana and now you are having to go farther and farther away to do the same thing, you're thinking, why? But if you're that farmer in Iowa, nothing's really changed for you. So you don't even think about it. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a farmer in Iowa. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. We all have our, I think people like you and I that have been fortunate enough to travel around the globe, it, it expands your, your worldview, right? But if your life yeah. is self-contained in a, you know, small rural living and that you're content with that life, it's hard to envision a, a bigger world when you haven't experienced it. Yeah, totally agree. So I, I ebb and flow all the time between like, hope and utter despair these days, um, working day in, day out on these like massive crimes and corruption and like seeing all these terrible things done to our plants and animals and environment. How are you able to kind of stay optimistic and keep pushing forward and not just say like, I give up? You know what motivates me now more than anything is the dedication of the people I work with overseas, right? I do my job usually 75% of the time from behind a desk. And that desk is now a standing desk, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, you gotta, gotta keep moving. Yeah, you know, um, so I go to, let's say Brazil where a guy who I tangentially worked with, like we were on emails and, and I think we met once at like a, a gathering, was murdered. 
um, because he was trying to protect, and he was a, a government official, and he was murdered at a stoplight because he was trying to protect the forest in the region that he worked. I, I work a lot with people in an area where you spend a lot of time in Central Africa, you know, and, and East Africa and Kenya, and those guys are outnumbered and outgunned by the criminals. And I, in, a, in, in many ways, need to support them because let's say, let's just take a hypothetical example where uh, um, a number of elephants are killed in Kenya and the person takes those tusks and they're sitting on them, you know, kind of bidding to the high, sending to the highest bidder. And one of those people might be in the United States or one of those people might be using a United States bank. Well, it's going to be a lot easier for me with my computer and, you know, my investigative agents who really know what they're doing. And they're, they're great, dedicated folks. And we've got a lot of the email servers are based here so we can do email search warrants. So the guys in Africa and Kenya are riding around in trucks facing people with machine guns and helicopters. Man, they're still doing it. They're still doing it, even though it is putting them and their family and their livelihood at risk literally every day. That was a terrible use of the word literally. <laughs> I, I know what you mean, though. Like the, their day, day in, day out stakes are literal life and death. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And yet they are still doing it. They still care. They love their culture. They're proud of it. They want to protect it. And the thing is, most of the people abusing their national and, and natural heritage are not local, right? These are foreign interests mm -hmm. who see an opportunity. So they are out there fighting it, and they get up every morning and do it, and they put themselves on the line. Well, you know, I can keep on fighting that fight from behind my computer to support them. And that really motivates me so much. I just think about what they're doing. And it's hard. When, when you meet and work with people like that, it gives you hope. When you see people who are so passionate and so dedicated and so good, it gives you hope. A lot of those people come from the most impoverished places, right? Where you would say oh, you know, they don't have much. They should really be like trying to cheat the system to get ahead, but really they, they don't. They genuinely care and have empathy and compassion and all the things yeah. uh, that are much harder for us Americans to, to hold on to these days. You know, uh, soon before I started working for the government, they changed the rules where you're no longer allowed to fly business class, period. I mean, for grunts like me. <laughs> It used to be if you were flying over like six or eight hours, which I do regularly, you could book a business class ticket. And you will hear people complain about that. Oh, you know, the good old days. I was working with a woman in DRC who's like, I just want petrol for my truck so I can actually go to the site of the crime. Now, when she gets there, there's probably going to be guys with guns. She just wants the gas to be able to get there. Yeah. Perspective. Perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I come back from working with, with people overseas, I'm like, so gung-ho, so ready to change the world. And then slowly I get back into my, like, you know, regular grind. Of course. Yeah. We, we fall into routines. And uh, I think that's what's been so difficult for the pandemic for everyone, right? It was just like, Routine gone for everyone simultaneously. And then yeah. pe people are, you know, adapting differently and, of course, struggling differently. And uh, some people are actually benefiting. Some people are literally dying and yeah. everything in between. So it's uh, it becomes very, very difficult, but kind of hopefully enlightening when we come through this, you know, that people say hey, we really didn't have it that bad, or a lot of us, compared to so many people on the planet. Right. All we had to do was wear a mask, man. 
<laughs> hey, that's tough for some people. It's very tough. <laughs> um, that's that's because they don't have a, a cool Buffalo Bills mask that their mom made them. Like <laughs> I do. Hey, man, the Bills are they're finally good again. You got to be feeling good. My Niners are on the downslide. So. Oh, you're I, you know you know that I I support them because of you and that. That loyalty was tested when um, I lost my suicide league <laughs> the other week because I picked them. But yeah, at least I'm staying strong. At least Jimmy G is still one of the best looking people in the NFL. <laughs> we have that going for us. <laughs> if he can't throw the no. ball, whatever. <laughs> Very attractive team. No question about it. Very attractive team. Um, so you've. Your work's brought you all over the planet, um, and you've done your own travels as well. I'm just curious, what are what are one or two of sort of the strangest or most exotic places you've been, and what about those places made them extraordinary to you? Whew. Gosh, that's a tough question. Um, strange and exotic to me are, are different. You know, I did a trip with one of my younger brothers, pretty deep up into the Amazon, sleeping in a tent. My brother's dugout canoe that was already, he was bailing out pretty aggressively to keep it afloat, got rammed by a pink dolphin. Wow. Um, which are actually pretty aggressive animals. I mean, that was like waking up in the Amazon we fished for piranha and ate those for dinner. We had a guide. We didn't, we didn't, I mean, the guide was this incredible guy, um, grew up in a tiny village, 40 hours by boat from the nearest actual town. And even that town is not connected anywhere else by roads, but waking up, knowing that you're surrounded by all these things that are trying to kill you and all these things that are trying to save you from all the things that are trying to kill you. <laughs> when you know, we, so we saw a coral snake and asked the guide, what happened? My brother asked the guy, what happens if you get bit? The guy's like, you die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. You're dead. <laughs> Don't get bit. That's it. Sorry, we're seven hours from the nearest electricity. Like... <laughs> you die. And that, I mean, that was unique to me for a few reasons. One, you know, my brother's 10, 11 years younger than me. And so it, it was a unique feeling to feel both this camaraderie, but also like, oh my God, if something happens to my brother and he's a little crazy, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. The, re the responsibility, right? So you're, you're free in one sense, but tethered to your family ties in another yeah like normally when i do this if i'm by myself i you know i take a lot of risks i do like i i i'm i, I am a risk taker in that sense that totally flipped when i'm looking at my little brother and i'm like oh i don't want to take so many risks given it's also his unique personality we set up our tents which took a while to find a place far enough above water and so we're setting them up and I'm like, oh shit, uh, where's Peter? And we're looking around and like, the, it's super dense jungle. And all of a sudden I see him swinging like 15 feet up from this vine. <laughs> and I'm like, Peter, like many of these vines can kill you. Like it's now given there's probably a flower that you can crush up and rub on it to save you. But like, you can't just go climbing random vines in the Amazon. And I got that in, in, in my head. I'm like, wait a minute. I would have done that if I was by myself. Why am I judging him from doing But I, I judged, I yelled, I pulled him down from there after I took a picture. Shame and, uh, on you, young man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was really unique just because it's also something, I mean, I may never be able to, you know, camp in a tent in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon again with one of my little brothers, who's also one of my best friends in the world. Like that, that was pretty cool. Did you ever have a moment of real danger or was it that every moment was so potentially dangerous that it just becomes baseline and you're, you're comfortable? Both. So yes, there's always, I mean, I, I've got this picture of one huge spider eating another huge spider <laughs> and 
it was just on the bottom of a leaf when we were doing a night hike. So like there's that baseline level, but when we saw the coral snake, it, I mean, it was all of three feet from where we were walking. That was terrifying. Um, and when, when my brother got rammed like that, all of a sudden I see like his canoe shaking when he was already bailing it out. And I'm like, Oh my God, my brother is going to go down in the Amazon. Yeah. That's not water you want to be in, in any capacity, really. No, we did. We did go swimming. What is your reaction when I tell you we swam on, in the Amazon river? I mean, I, any murky water, I'm, I'm terrified already. Okay. Many people will say, what about that fish that swims up your wiener? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. But I mean, <laughs> there are so many other creatures in the deep, you know, lurking in the mud that I would be scared of. Yeah. I mean, they've got catfish there that are like, 11 feet long that could suck you in like half your body i'm more worried about that arapaima and stuff yeah arapaima there yeah look at you oh yeah i watch my river monsters it's a great show you know i love that show so much it was so long like i would start watching an episode and then i'm an hour in and i'm like wait i thought this was a half hour tv show but i can't turn away i yeah. can't <laughs> I forget that guy's name, uh, the British guy, but he's awesome. Jeremy something. He was just like a school teacher who just loved fish. He wasn't. He's not like a biologist or like a famous fisherman. He was like a high school teacher. Hey, man, everyone's got their passion. Yeah. My <laughs> passion is watching him. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's how I am, too. Speaking of being behind the computer. So like, I'll just I'll just watch you on TV explore. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in all honesty, man, I really do miss traveling. Um, I know a lot of friends, I'm not going to judge them one way or another. Everyone has their varying degrees of comfort, right? Of what they're willing to, it's all calculated risk. And how much risk are you willing to take? Or how much do you feel you're at risk or putting other people at risk? I'm not getting on a plane anytime soon. I just, I don't need to. Me neither. Yeah. But I do miss traveling. Um but so you haven't been traveling at all? No, but so when the coronavirus, when it first really got got big, I was in Africa and um, like when they started, like countries started blocking people. And that was another experience that I may never have again, which was a honey badger tore through our camp. <laughs> oh, my God, that's awesome. <laughs> It was like, first off, this, this, this. Honey like, badger don't give a shit. <laughs> uh, dude. So, you know, you, you've been on safari. This was yeah. like a safari, but then you actually like camp in tents at night. And sure, like a um, glamping safari. Yeah. And this, this guide was amazing. He was like 60, had this like super gravelly voice and just really deadpan. Same kind of thing. We're like, what happens? He's like, well, you die. Um, <laughs> yeah. So they always ask like, oh, is there anything you really want to see? And like, you know, over the years, I've seen a lot of things. And my colleague who I was traveling with was like, oh, I really want to see a honey badger. Have you ever seen one? And the guy's like, not very much, but man, if you do, they're crazy. Like, they just don't care about anything. They will face off a lion. And my colleague's like, yeah, Honey Badger doesn't give a shit. <laughs> and the guy's like, yeah, no, it doesn't. And my colleague's like, but you've seen the YouTube, right? And he's like, no, what are you talking about? His explanation was exactly the same as what the guy says in the video. And then we're in this camp and you hear this rustling and like things moving around. <laughs> and my colleague's like, yeah, it's probably a honey badger. And the guy's like, I think it is a honey badger. And he flips on his spotlight and boom, there's a honey badger. <laughs> so this was at night? It was night, yeah. And he had gone to where uh, we had cooked. And the, the dishes were clean, but he just knocked them over and then ran away. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But so I'm leaving from there. And it was like the beginning where everybody's like wiping down their seats on the airplane, but like 
people weren't wearing masks yet. So we're all like staring at each, like the first person who coughs, we're all like, oh, <laughs> yeah. we're all going down. And we, like, wipe, we, and then we like wipe our seat a little bit more. I mean, it was like March 7th or 8th or something. Man, it seems like a lifetime ago. It yeah. seems like a lifetime ago. And then you get home after however long you were in Africa with no good toilet paper and you can't get toilet paper at home either. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that doesn't that feel like ages ago though? When it was like the panic buying, like people literally thought it was going to be like twenty eight days later. Like, yeah. oh, this is it, like the apocalypse. And it was because we made it like that. <laughs> well, yeah. Now everyone has two years worth of toilet paper, so there's plenty <laughs> of stock out there. You've traveled with me. You know, two years for a regular person lasts me two months. <laughs> So of all the places you've been, I'm wondering if there's like a specific country or a, or a culture that you've encountered that seems to kind of embrace uh, the environment and nature the most. Like what's the oh, most yeah. uh, eco-conscious of countries or cultures that you've seen? This is just my opinion. And I mean, there's been a number like people in Botswana, People in Kenya, they're so connected to their environment. I spent a bunch of time with um, Maasai. Some, there was like a local Maasai group that had set up a, a, a basically a tour company that they owned and ran, and they're incredible. But to me, I've never seen anything quite like Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Like every person you meet in Sri Lanka can tell you about every flower, every tree, how they're integrated in the ecosystem, what they can be used for, what their grandmother used them for, and why they're important. I felt so, not envious, but almost like if only we could all be like this, the world would be a better place because so there's, I was told, I actually have not researched this, but I was told that breadfruit trees in Sri Lanka are illegal to cut down. And it's not because the wood is endangered or anything. It's because breadfruit, the you know massive, massive fruits that they grow are free. So like they're more impoverished people have a, an easy natural source of food so you can't cut down these trees because they benefit the population. Yeah, what a simple human solution that seems so alien to us. I shouldn't be so amazed that years later I'm still talking about it. Yeah, right. But I am. Yeah, it should just be like, of course, because so people right. can survive. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's that we're so developed here, right? Most people don't think about where the chicken came from that they're eating for dinner that night. Right, right, yeah. Well, I mean, I know that mine came from dinosaurs because my nuggets are shaped like dinosaurs. <laughs> that is actually what I had for lunch today. <laughs> Dino nut. Way to fuel Dino up for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> It's the weekend, you know, treat yourself. All right, last question before we do a rapid fire. Is there one thing environmentally that you think is kind of our greatest threat right now? Something that we can we can all sort of look at and say, hey, this should be the focus immediately. You know, I, I, I want to say climate change, but I feel like that would just make me so boring. Um <laughs> Maybe ocean plastic, microplastics. Um, yeah, that's pretty haunting. Yeah, it is. It's To me, it's terrifying. You know, it's just tough because I watched The Social Dilemma last night. I'm like, uh, smartphones? That's it. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. That, that haunted me. It really stayed with me for like a month. So good luck yeah. sleeping tonight. But like I would have random days where I wake up and I'm like distressed because of that. And it's not like some mind-blowing thing we didn't know, right? It's just shining a light on sort of your everyday practice and how you're being manipulated, and that's terrifying. 
Right. And see, here I was thinking that my only social media manipulation was Tara criticizing me for not posting enough. And then when I finally put one story up about my cat being cat of the month at a winery, <laughs> Is that I true? just get a message from her that says, give the people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you do have one diehard fan in Tara. Turns out there's other people manipulating me too. <laughs> so I did a trip with uh, a different younger brother. I travel with my family a lot. So like, it's a, it's a good thing about having a big family. I backpacked through Alaska with my sister and my buddy Ian. Backpacked through Southeast Asia with one of my younger brothers. And then that same younger brother and my buddy Ian again, we backpacked through China and then through Tibet. And thinking back about your question before, the people in Tibet were, to me, some of the most incredibly in tune with their environment, which is even more amazing because they basically have none. It's a high altitude desert where like nothing grows and yet they do not exploit what they have. I can't remember the, the name of where the Dalai Lama used to live. Um, Paul, P-O-L, P-O-T. Anyway, it, it's basically the, the, the Dalai Lama's former residence. And it's made of bricks, made with twigs, no full branches so that they didn't have to kill trees to make the bricks. So wow. it's just like tightly bundled bricks that amongst many other things. I mean, that trip was amazing, not just because like you never know if you're going to be even allowed into Tibet again. So we got a little lucky. Yeah. Also yeah. doing it with my brother and, and my buddy Ian, who, you know, we've we've grown up together since we were obnoxious uh, prepubescence. Later, we're obnoxious pubescence and then later obnoxious adults. But that level, it's different. It's not. In Sri Lanka, they're very like they know everything about everything and, and how to use it. In Tibet, it was just like, don't don't kill stuff. Let's just not kill stuff. Let's just use what we can without killing stuff. It's like, oh, what an amazing concept. Everything is milk. You can milk the cow without killing it. So let's use. I'm not saying that everything in Tibet was milk. I'm saying they're perspective was the way we see milk. Yeah, that I mean, that is really interesting to me as well, because you hear so much about, oh, it's human nature to kill and, and this and that. So you wonder how much of uh, sort of the nature versus nurture argument, right? Like, and how much of it is, is religious belief? Is it cultural belief? But, but yeah, you have these ecosystems of, and cultures that embrace sort of this peaceful way of life and and don't yeah. don't think intuitively violently um and conversely you know you have of course like like primitive tribes that might only think in terms of war and and conquest so yeah yeah very interesting yeah okay that was that was stewing in my brain i had to get it out uh papua new guinea as well i don't know have you been to papua new guinea no, and I would love to hear a little. I mean, I've talked to you a little bit about it, but I would love for you to expound on it for the rest of of the pod world. Yeah, so so I was in the Central Highlands uh, province, which is you know landlocked in between these massive mountains that basically it wasn't discovered, um, you know, by the white man until the 1930s. So everyone lives off the land. So talk about in tune with the nature and you look at it and you say, wow, this is frightening and violent because everyone's carrying a giant machete or bush knife. But literally, like, it's a tool because they're all farming and they're all working the land every day and surviving off the land. And so really unique, really great to see that, but also kind of disheartening to see they're just really starting to get affected by technology and modernization. And so you see 
the guy with the bush knife farming with the Coca-Cola can. And they just got mobile phones. So they might not have food and water to drink, but the guy's going to town walking uh, because he needs to up his mobile minutes rather than get clean water for his seven children to drink. So really interesting. uh, I mean, very few places, I think, on the planet that have been that isolated for that long. And to see how quickly the modernization is sweeping in um, and people, they want that cell phone. They want those blue jeans. They want... Right. What they see, um, had they never seen it, they never would have coveted that and wanted it and ch- right. changed their way of life. So it it was a very awesome experience. Um, and yeah, talking about eco-consciousness, and I think for the most part, people are very, very in tune with the land and the nature. And uh, it's you just pa- part of their, their life there. So I only want you to answer this if you are going to reinforce my pre-existing belief. Okay. Which is that when you went there, it was basically like at the end of Apocalypse Now when wasn't there some like surgeon who was doing some kind of like spinal surgery or yes, something? Yes, yes. So that guy I didn't get to personally meet, but there is a man called um, uh, Dr. Father Jaworski, and he is a Polish immigrant who uh, was a medical doctor turned Catholic priest who who moved to Papua New Guinea, like permanently, started a hospital in the Kundiawa province, and ran... Um, experimental treatments on paraplegic people. So incurable spinal disease, this and that. And he literally came up with his own experimental surgery because he didn't have to go through any red tape or bureaucracy to get medical stuff done. These people had no hope. So it was like, you know, what's the worst case? They can't walk already. So, and he had some ridiculous number like 25 percent of his patients learned to walk again and it was something like he was fusing the the femur onto the spinal column and i mean just wild stuff all in a place where they don't even have an mri machine so right literally performing like miracles um and they like deify this this guy just like marlon brando (laughs) i mean yeah it is like a a dr moreau type situation going on maybe except he's not fusing humans and animals i don't think (laughs) i mean he may have fused one hand to a forehead but like really it's it's all in the name of science all right well let's get into a quick rapid fire The nicest people on planet Earth are found where? Philippines. The Buffalo Bills will finish with a record of what this year? 10 and 5 due to one game being canceled. (laughs) Fair, fair. Uh, Yes or no, Josh Allen is the godsend you've been looking for in Bills country. Yes. (laughs) You could have stopped after God. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, the sexiest of the seven dwarfs was who? Sleepy, man. He's spending all his time in bed. <laughs> uh, most women find your beard sexy or scratchy? Sexy. <laughs> I have to say that right. <laughs> I'll have to pull, uh, pull the women about that. Yeah, I mean, just don't ask about the chest hair. <laughs> Uh, your favorite international food is what? Could just be a type of international food. I mean, it's just, I want to say burrito, but that's an American thing. <laughs> I, I guess I've got to go, I guess I've got to go to tacos if you can consider that international. Me- Mexican food. Do you have a, a favorite type of Mexican? Is it like, uh, you know, there's so many different types. Oh yeah. I like, I, I like my refried beans, refried in lard. Sure. I yeah. want like sloppy, 
you know, the stuff where the people are going to leave your party after serving it because they need to go to the bathroom. Scalding, That's my kind. scalding hot plate just smothered in queso. <laughs> yeah, like I want, I want my refried beans to be so like amalgamated with cheese and lard <laughs> that they're they like slip between the fork when you try to scoop some up it like filters in between okay yeah i'm getting a good visual there <laughs> yeah the um the sexiest foreign accent is what argentinian oh very specific south american accent yeah they say sho instead of yo me chamo oh, okay okay yeah. your uh, your favorite type of tropical fruit is what God, I am about to be so boring and say banana, but like the real bananas from like when you when you get them from a tree, not just like the one species that we get in the U.S., but like the ones that you get on a plate that were picked from a tree in Costa Rica that morning. Sure. Do you like plantains? I do like plantains. I do, but I like those fried or... Uh, the chips that come in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. You know, I can't eat banana or I'll vomit, right? But I love the flavor oh, of banana. <laughs> I'm aware. Yeah. I mean, I could go with, I, I do love mango too. Um, but man, I just love a good banana. If you could fight one celebrity and you each get a weapon, who would you fight and what's the weapon? Kirk Cameron. Brass knuckles. <laughs> that's so. I that that's a little bit of an inside joke. Okay. Because my family and I have been arguing for about twenty years about whether I could beat up Kirk Cameron, and it's clear that I could. But I wouldn't want anything more than brass knuckles because anything more would kind of like undermine my argument that I could beat him up. Yeah, you you still have to have some skill to wield it, but it's pretty much you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I had a similar argument with a friend. Uh, he thought he could take Sly Stallone, and I called bullshit on him. And he's like, dude, he's old, and like he fights in the movies. And I'm like, dude, he's an HGH monster. He would destroy you. <laughs> yeah. like, I do not want to fight Sly. Also, if we've learned anything, he always gets back up. That's like, right. One of you is going to die in that fight. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, Elon Musk. Visionary or douchebag? Both. <laughs> yeah, that's Do the I right have to answer. choose one? No, that's the right answer. I would choose visionary, but both. Yes, couldn't agree more. Uh, the most beautiful part of the female body is what? The hips. Oh, okay. Like that, that area, like above the butt and below the boobs. Yeah, you like a bit of the curvature on a woman. Oh, yeah. Yeah, love it. I do as well. I like a like a full form. <laughs> um, you know what I say? <laughs> if I wanted to look at like skinny, unmuscular legs and straight hips, like I've got a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> How many times do you actually say objection in in a, a day of court? It depends on the douchiness of defense counsel, but pretty often. Like 10, Pretty 20, often. 50? If it's during a trial, yeah, somewhere between 20 and 40. I mean, you can go you can go too far where the jury's like, uh, you know, you're just being annoying. We all, we don't care what this other guy's saying anymore, so you can stop objecting. Do you have to give a reason or can you just say objection? Depends on the judge. Um, you're supposed to give a reason, but some judges don't like you to because they think it would bias the jury. So, but like, you know, objection, argumentative, objection, asked and answered, object and out of scope. Like that's typically the, that's the most common way to do it. And then if there needs to be a bigger discussion, the judge will call you to sidebar. Okay. I'm just trying to gauge the reality of television courtroom drama. Oh yeah. Not real at all. <laughs> not like there's, you know, you, you know why it's not real because there's drama. Yeah. So it's really just pretty damn boring. It's so boring, especially my stuff. Like, I put up witnesses to talk about how oysters are grown. Like, unless you really want to know about spat, 
and it's not just spat, but it's it's called uh, when baby oysters, which are spat, when they actually like have to grow uh, somewhere. Um, like that is is very important to the growth, and the rates of that are very important. That's not exactly uh, the same kind of drama you're getting from uh, How to Make a Murder or what, whatever it was called. Uh, yeah, How to Get Away with Murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get, I often in my life am told that I should watch that so I become a better lawyer. <laughs> Not by other lawyers, <laughs> just people in general. Yeah, you're like, thank you for telling me how to do my job. All right, last question, and I was clearly put up to this, but uh, what is it that you miss the most about Tara? <laughs> her laugh, come on. How could it be anything besides her laugh? But how could you limit it to just one? Her laugh, her enthusiasm, Keep her in mind, excitement. She's, she's probably listening. I don't know if she's made it all the way through the podcast, but when this is live, this is, uh, this is giving her all the feels right now. We should do another podcast about how great Tara is <laughs> and how much she looks like a Tarsier. Talk about a sidebar. If anyone doesn't know, I will say my final thought, and then I'll give one to Patrick. When we went to the Philippines, there are these wonderful creatures called the Tarsier. Look it up if you don't know of them. They're like kind of like bush babies, these giant eyes, and they're really, really small, like the size of a lime or something. And uh, they're only on this one island, I think, right, of Bohol. Bohol, yeah. These beautiful creatures, and unfortunately, uh, like so many endangered species, people try and domesticate them, and it, you know, ruins them and, and drives them to suicide, actually. But uh, so they're, ad they're adorable, adorable little creatures, and uh, if you're looking for a smile, just Google search Tarsier right now. Patrick, uh, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Do you have any final thoughts uh, just about your work as, uh, you know, a environmental lawyer, but just an environmental advocate in life um, and, and a travel enthusiast? What, what is it about seeing the globe and experiencing places uh, and, and protecting the planet that, that inspires you? And what do you have to say to others that are equally inspired? I, there's a few things. One, what I really love is to be able to sit in front of a computer in front of another man with such a beautiful mustache. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's not something that you get to do every day. And I feel like if I hadn't traveled as much as I have, I wouldn't have been invited on this podcast. And therefore I would not have been able to see the current perfect like i'm not trying on a mustache but i've got it but like it kind of just grew this way you're really crushing it I, so I, I have a clear like mason dixon line in the middle though that's my only weakness but, but that's what's so perfect about it that's what's so perfect it's like you put no effort into that <laughs> you know and it just works appreciate that buddy no problem <laughs> that's my final thought well, as it should be. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to my guest, Mr. Patrick Duggan. And thank you for listening in. This has been Travel Unraveled. Bye. Bye.